so what are some protocols that people could explore for continuous endurance training? I mean, I've thrown out this 150 to 180 minute zone two cardio, but that's really the, um, that's really the kind of kindergarten of endurance. Yeah. Um, and there I'm probably being generous. It's probably the nursery school of endurance that everyone should do. What, what sorts of other protocols? I realize that can be very goal-directed, but is it unreasonable, for instance, for somebody to do um, four hours of, of continuous endurance training with intervals in there as well to get it kind of all mm. around heart health and the ability to go long distances? Yeah, I'll answer this too. It's the very first one. To tackle the, the long duration endurance is how I refer to it. Um, you asked earlier about heart rate zones. Um, to me, that's almost totally irrelevant. It, it doesn't matter, right? If you're moving, you're moving. That's that's the functional piece here. Um, if you want to push it and go at a non-conversational pace, that has tremendous health benefits. If you want to do it a little bit slower, fine. If you're at the pace where you can have a conversation, to me, I don't even count that as exercise. That's not to. It's not a pejorative, by the way. Um, that is just general physical movement. And it is extraordinarily clear. You need a lot of that. You need a lot more of that than we get. You can do this in a couple of efficient ways. Just taking your phone calls moving. If you've got a 30-minute call every day or most days of the week and you can do that while moving, you've checked not that whole box, but a pretty good chunk of it. And that could even be done inside. 100%. Pacing back and forth. I'm a big pacer. The uh, Yeah, me too. Like you probably saw me. Like I'm going to walk up and down all over the place. Um, most of the time when I'm in my office working, like I'm, I'm shadow boxing, like I'm doing air squats, not even intentionally. I'm just like, do you have one of those treadmills under the desk? I don't, but like every lab I ever came through, somebody did. We did an episode on workspace optimization and the data on those treadmills are yeah. pretty interesting. They definitely increase alertness, um, for, which for obvious reasons, even a little bit of movement is going to generate a, no a little bit of adrenaline. Um, so pacing around, moving, taking calls, moving, getting yeah. walks when you can. And then in terms of building endurance. Let's say somebody wants to, quote unquote, get into better shape. Yep. Um, they already may or may not already have some size and strength that they're happy with. And they just want to get in, they want to improve their health. Yep. Yeah, so so I, what, I can when help. does that 150, 180 minutes thing tick over into a different protocol? Yeah. Okay. So I think the way that I can outline a weekly schedule, just as a conceptual model here, um, that long duration stuff is not even counting, as I mentioned, right? It's just a, this is what you need to do as a human moving forward. We haven't improved. If you're extremely unfit, you may see some changes in cardiovascular health there. But for the most part, this is just knocking out the general physical practice. You need to be higher functioning. So whatever that time domain is, I don't really care. Um, it's, it's not a huge concern of mine. What I think you need to hit are these nodes. You need to do something once a week that gets you to a maximum heart rate. Now, I don't have to literally mean max, but close. So this means really sucking for air. Really. Like, as high as you can possibly get. You can wear a heart rate monitor if you want. But maximal heart rate, the, the rough equation we say is 220 minus your age. So if you're 40 years old, your maximum heart rate is probably about 180 beats per minute. Now, I can tell you flat out right now, um, my max heart rate is close to 210, which means I'm 10 years old. So take that number with a grain of salt. I have had a bunch of professional athletes who are in their 20s and their max heart rate's 175. And they are in way better shape than I am. So maximum heart rate is not a good proxy for physical fitness. It's a rough number. An easy way to do it is if you have a heart rate monitor or anything like that, do the hardest workout you can possibly do, see what the highest number you get as, and assume that's close. That's If you want to just start at 220 minus your age, that's fine too. Um, do something though where you're like, yep, this is death. Like this is really, really challenging. For how long? However long that takes you. That can be a 30 second go on an Aerodyne or Aerosalt bike. That could be a, um, uh, do one of those things where you kind of like sprint, run as hard as you can during the straightaway on a track and then walk the corners. Kind of an old classic back when you and I were kids, mm -hmm. interval training. They don't do that anymore? I guess, I don't know. I don't ever even talk about it. In PE class, we had to change and if you didn't bring running shoes, you had to do it barefoot. Oh, I love it. And uh, I love your teacher. Yeah, it wasn't a, we, our football, basketball, baseball teams weren't that good, but um, anything like running cross country just because of where I grew up, oh, yeah. brutal, brutal coaches. So that, yeah, they'd make the, the all kids do the, these runs. Yep. So yeah. it can be in the, the 30 probably seconds at a minimum. It, it's hard to get you to a true heart rate max in shorter than 30 seconds. You can get to total suck mm -hmm. in under 20 seconds, but getting to a true heart rate max is, is probably going to take more than 30 seconds. So, it doesn't really matter what you want to do. It can be, uh, again, a sprint uphill. It could be, what well, you're talking, it could be burpees to death. 
you know, like whatever, whatever you want to do. Although just, those have an eccentric component, right? Yeah, they do. Real, yeah. No question about it. Um, but if you Not did- to actual death, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> if you just did, I'm going to do as many burpees as I can for 90 seconds. It probably won't take you much longer than that to get to close to- And is to that the whole heart. workout? Could be. So once a week, get to max heart rate. Touch it. I love it. Touch it. It's not the best, but it'll it'll work. Um, and, and what are the specific benefits that that provides? Okay, so earlier in our in our chat, we were, we outlined the rule of specificity, specific adaptation adaptation to impose demand. If you're never getting to that high of a pace, you're never. It would be like trying to get stronger, but only going to sixty percent. So every cardiovascular adaptation that occurs with cardiovascular training is just simply going to get to the top or end by doing this. So if you just start at the heart itself, stroke volume increase. So this is the amount of blood that's kicked out per contraction. Uh, cardiac output, resting heart rate. If you go to the endothelial function, you're talking about nitric oxide release, endothelial health in general, um, capillary, mitochondria all the way down. Like you just walk through the whole system, pulmonary exchange to the lungs. All of those are going to benefit by being challenged to their maximum. It also teach you where your vomit reflex is. Yeah, there yeah. you go, right? <laughs> Let's hope not. Um, stress is what causes adaptation, right? So if you push your, okay, here's the difference. If you did 25 minutes of steady state, you're not challenging the same thing as what we just talked about. Um, the way that I explain this is if you understand the point, the point of physiological failure, then you understand the place of adaptation. That's it. So if you and I both go run on a, we did a both did a VO2 max test. So a classic VO2 max test is going to take eight to 12 minutes. And it's going to look something like this. We're going to get in a treadmill and we're going to run. And every minute, I'm going to just slightly increase that treadmill, either the speed or the grade. Most of the time it's the speed, right? So we, we get to a high grade, say 10% grade or something. And then we go five miles per hour, 5.2, 5.4, and we just go until you can't go any longer. Now, let's say you and I did that and we had the same exact time frame. And so we, we both went eight minutes. Um, the time that you last is not the thing that we care about, right? It's the, it's the volume of oxygen that you breathe out is what determines it. So let's say we went to the same time domain and we had the same VO2 max. Let's say they were both 50 milliliters per kilogram per minute, which is like a okay number, but that's nothing to be extremely proud about. Just because we have the same number does not mean we have the same point of physiological failure. And this matters because it's going to answer the, the what do I do about it then question, right? So if you got off and I, and I started asking you a series of questions and you're like, and I basically said, why'd you quit? You know, why did, why did you jump off the treadmill? Why'd you stop? And you were like, my chest, like I couldn't catch my breath. I thought my heart was going to explode. Okay, great. If you ask me and I said, my legs were on fire, like I was breathing hard, but I couldn't take another step. This is a very rough indicator of different places of physiological disruption. Now, what I've seen a lot with my professional athletes, especially like fighters, they are tend, they're going to generally fail in their legs because they don't often do a lot of strength training in their legs. They don't do a lot of leg work. They're fighting on their back, literally, a lot, or on top or on their knees. So their, their legs tend to give out before there. Someone who fails in the cardiovascular system, like say you did a lot of leg training, um, typically like an endurance athlete who's that's not going to be their issue. It's just going to be they're going to reach a heart rate and ventilation threshold that's they can no longer handle. If I put you on the exact same training protocols, it's not going to be as effective because you're going to always fail at your legs and they're going to always fail at their cardiovascular system. I need to flip that, right? You need to put you in a position to where you can reach a true heart rate or ventilation challenge while your legs are still hanging in there um, or the opposite. So, the training protocol is based on that point of failure. Um, the adaptation is in the same thing. So if you are uh, failing because of your legs, then you might see a greater increase in capitalization in your legs. Relative to somebody else who's failing in their um, cardiovascular system, they may see a greater change in, in something on that side of the equation. So that it, it matters how you're failing at I, all times. What I love about this is that it's it sounds like it's like a thermometer for where one is weak and needs work, but also provides a stimulus to improve the very thing that you need. That's, that's you need the trick, support right? In. So uh, to just get real brass tacks about it, it would be once a week. Okay, yeah. 90, 90 seconds near maximum heart rate. I'll make it Could easier. I do more? Could I, you know, could oh, yeah. I do five or six of those 90 second bouts? No question. You can do, um, as long as you touch that max heart rate, I'm good, right? Ideal world, probably four to eight. In that single session. Ideal. 
Okay. Right. If that takes you 20 seconds or 90 seconds, it's fine. Um, if you want to do 30 on, 30 off, you want to do 20 on, 40 off, 40 on, 20 off, those numbers don't matter. And is there an interference effect of this on the other sorts of training that we've talked about? It actually about? tends to be complementary. There, there is the the evidence available suggests that this high interval stuff is is more likely to be complementary to hypertrophy training, um, probably because of lactate uh, and some other cool things, um, which are very beneficial molecules that people don't understand. They they think it's bad. It's actually a hugely beneficial thing. Um, it can be interference. It can provide an interference if. Calories are not accounted for, if rest is not accounted for, and, and other things. But in general, it's it's probably okay. Um, I wouldn't add it to your equation if you don't need it for maximizing hypertrophy. But for the person who wants to just get well-rounded physiology, yeah, I wouldn't hesitate um, to do these even in the same session or different sessions. Terrific.